My name is Jacob Schreiber. I'm a sixth year PhD student at the University of Washington. This is my final year there, so I'm really excited about that. <laughs> Thank you. And to be clear, it's not because UW is a bad school or anything. It's just six years is a long time to spend at any particular academic institution. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you about a new software package that I've written and released. Uh, for people to use. This one is called Apricot, and it focuses on submodular optimization with the purpose being for machine learning applications. This is just the newest in my long line of various fruitware that you may be familiar with my other packages, which are pomegranate for probabilistic modeling, avocado for, oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> one person has heard of it. Uh, avocado, which does deep, uh, deep tensor factorization for human epigenomics data, which is probably a little bit more niche. Uh, and then Rambutan, which models the three-dimensional structure of the genome. So um, I'm really excited about this because this is the first new package I've, I've had in a while versus just continuing to develop these old ones. But having to give a presentation here meant that I had to make new slides. And I haven't given this presentation before, so I wanted to make sure I put the appropriate amount of care in. And so much like I'm sure many of you put uh, when you had to do like a particularly important term paper when you were in university, late last night I began. <laughs> that joke was brought to you by the great 21st century philosopher Conan O'Brien. So uh, let's jump in. So Apricot implements uh, submodular optimization. And I'm sure that most of you don't know what that is. And if you don't know what that is, and you're scared of math like me, it's going to be OK. This is going to be mostly a high-level overview of the types of things you can do with submodular optimization and why you might want to do that. The back end is mostly abstracted, and we have a lot of documentation and examples that show how it works on the GitHub. So if you want to know more, you can just um, go and find it. So the big problem that we're facing is the fact that data sets have been getting increasingly big. Um, we, back around 100 years ago, there was this canonical IVIS data set, which was measurements about various pictures of IVISes that had 150 examples, and there were four features. And everybody loves using this in order to show their basic method on scikit-learn. Um, back then, a computer didn't mean the thing that I'm projecting off of. A computer was quite literally a person who was running calculations. And so you might right now be able to run things very quickly on the IRIS data set, but imagine having to, you know, derive updates for logistic regression by hand on 150 examples. Not fun. So even back then, there might be um, reasons to try to reduce data. Uh, around 60 years later, the popular MNIST data set came out. And for those of you who don't know, uh, the NIST in MNIST actually stands for the National Institute of Standards and Technology, because this is one of their standard data sets for handwritten digits. Um, academics then took it and cleaned it up a little bit because academics aren't happy with anything that anyone else does. Uh, and they modified it, thus the M in MNIST. And they released it as this thing that had 70,000 images, uh, hundreds of pixels, which can each be interpreted as a feature. And that was orders of magnitude bigger. Then around a decade later, ImageNet came out. And this was 14 million. Uh, over 14 million images, more pixels, higher resolution, orders of magnitude bigger even still. But this growth in data hasn't been just in images. Uh, we heard in the keynote that there are other types of data out there as well, like words. And so the billion word corpus came out a few years after that, which curiously enough doesn't actually have a billion words in it, but I guess 800 million is close enough that they can claim that title. Um, and so these large data sets are good, because when you have more data, you cover more modalities of your data that you might care about. For example, if you are producing an image uh, recognition system, you might want to see images of you know, a dog in different positions, in different uh, lighting conditions, so that you might be able to better recognize it in the real world. So that's great. But there are downsides that typically what also happens as you increase the size of your data set is that you increase the redundancy of your data set. Maybe we don't really need 14 million images in ImageNet to be able to capture the core essence of what's going on there. A few papers have come out recently showing that the popular C410 and 100 data sets are super redundant with each other. They talk about an issue here where not only do you have redundancy in the data set, but that you'll have exact duplicates in your training and your test set. 
they talk about how this can cause overly optimistic assessments of how, uh, how well your model performs. But in addition to these exact duplicates, they also say they're a near duplicate, which are you know, almost the same image, very similar ones. Like you can see this picture of this fish on this right-hand side where it's just a slightly different color. Do those really count as different examples? They go further into that in their papers. What I'm going to talk about here is the simpler case, where what you care about is not necessarily do, uh, redundancy between your training and your test set, which is kind of a philosophical question, and more just that you have a giant training set and you want to reduce it down to a more manageable set. This has a lot of applications, that what, if you have some large data set which you can still compute on, you might not want to do things like hyperparameter selection on it because that would take a ton of time, or just even basic data exploration. So you might want to reduce it down to something that you can operate on a lot faster. There are other massive data sets that you simply can't compute on. There are these massive sky surveys that astronomers collect, which are literally just pictures of the sky at super high resolution over the course of the year. These are tens or hundreds of terabytes. Uh, and seem to get larger every time I ask an astronomer about it. I'm not an astronomer by trade, so I just think of them as pretty sky pictures, but apparently there's more than that. Um, and they quite literally cannot compute on them. And so something that you might want to do is say, okay, many of these pictures are very similar to each other because they're taken sequentially. What we'd like to do is reduce it down to the frames that contain the most different set of information on them and build our models or do our analyses on those. So. Submodular optimization, quite simply, is uh, very similar to convex optimization, which is a term that you hear a lot of academics talking about, but you don't hear about it so much in uh, conferences like this. But basically, submodular optimization is to submodular functions as convex optimization is to convex functions. So a convex function, we typically represent our machine learning models as convex functions, regardless of whether they you know, actually are or not. And so our machine learning model will make a prediction, and what we're trying to optimize are the weights in our model. By doing convex optimization approaches, we are tuning the weights in our model to get the best performance, and our convex optimization approach uh, gets us there. Submodular functions operate on sets. They tell you how good a particular set is, and by optimizing a submodular function, you are choosing the best set. There are a variety of contexts in which you might want to do this. Apricot focuses on the one where you have some massive data set, and you want to reduce it to a subset that, ma that minimizes the redundancy amongst the examples. So, I promised you there wasn't going to be a lot of math on it. I think there are three slides, and this is one of them. So I'll walk you through it, and if you don't quite understand it, that's okay, because I still don't. Uh, Submodular functions overall take the following form. Imagine that you have some big set Y. You have some proper subset of that X, where all the examples in X are in Y, and you have some new example. If you try to add that new example to the smaller data set, you are going to get a bigger gain than if you add it to the bigger data set. This is the exact same example, it's the exact same item. This, this is a way of, uh, this makes sense when you're trying to measure redundancy, that as you add examples to your data set, any new example is either going to be equivalently unredundant with any of the examples or slightly redundant with any of the new examples that you add in. So um, let's get a more concrete example using one of my favorite TV shows, Gossip Girl. Imagine that your submodular function is basically measuring the portion of the plot that's covered by a particular character. You could take the character on the left, Dan, and let's say that you get some value 10, which maybe measures the percentage of the plot that's covered by them. And then you take my favorite character, Blair, who's a huge drama queen, and you'd say that she's more central to many of the themes in the plot, and you'd get a higher score for her. But when you try to add them together, you don't quite get the individual ones added together. There's some redundancy because some of the plot involves both of these characters. And so instead of getting 27, you'd get 24. Now let's say that you want to add in another character, Jenny. Uh, you see that you get a very low increase in the score, going from 24 to 25, because Jenny's main purpose in the plot either seems to act as Dan, but worse, or Blair, but worse. So she's highly redundant with these two characters once you already have them in your set. So, one of the most common submodular functions is called facility location. And this arose quite literally from the task of locating facilities. The problem that companies would have is, I have, I have my locations around some country, let's say the United States, and I want to know where should I put my next facility. 
well, you want to put your next facility in a underrepresented region of the country that is likely to have many customers that are not currently served by one of your locations. So, uh, the way that facility uh, location works is on pairwise similarities, that you take two, data, uh, two points of data, you calculate the similarity between them, and you want to return a set that is highly similar with as many of the other points in the data set as possible. You can think of this kind of like k-means. The idea is that you want to select a set of centroids that are centrally located amongst the data so that all of your data points are well served by a centroid. It differs in that first k-means doesn't actually select an, a point of data that would be k-metoids, uh, and that k-means is an iterative algorithm, whereas this is just a greedy approach. But conceptually, they're very similar. Um, and so there's this equation here uh, that basically says that if you have some big data set Y, which is all your data, and you have some subset X, which is what you're trying to get out, that you can evaluate the quality of your subset X by saying, for each point in Y, what is the maximum similarity to one of your points in X? Basically, for each point of data, how similar are you, how similar are you to your closest centroid? And then summing that value up for all the points of data. To kind of give you a more visual representation of what this looks like, imagine that you have your pairwise similarity matrix. You've calculated the similarity between all pairs of values. And let's say that you already have, you want to evaluate the quality of this subset of four examples. So you've already selected the four examples whose similarities are highlighted in the red. What you do is that you, for each example that's not in that set, you say what is the maximum similarity to any of the values in that set. So you can, you're basically choose, you're calculating a max over those four values here. Then you just keep going along and the more purple it is, the higher the value of the max is. I didn't actually color in the main matrix because that's a lot of work and I didn't want to do that work. So you go through, you get some maximum similarity for each one of them and you can see that you've calculated maximum similarity for each of these values and now all you do is you take the sum. So calculating the max was the max term, now you calculate the sum of that and you get some quality score, which is basically how much of the space is covered. It doesn't explicitly have, a, have units attached to it, but um, uh, yeah. So if you want to add some new example in, um, this, uh, if, if you want to find the best subset, the problem is actually NP-hard. So typically what we do is that we use a greedy approximation. Uh, and Nemhauser in like 1973 showed that this greedy approximation is actually, actually off by only a constant factor, which is a super rare result. And so these subsets that you find by greedy selection are, are really good, and we do that because it's e easy. And so by greedy selection, I mean that you have some subset, you want to know what's the next best point, so you just go through and you say, if I added this point into my subset, what is the gain in this function? Uh, and so the way that you would calculate the gain is that you take what the maximum similarity of each point to the centroid is, um, and when you add in the new example, how much does that value increase? And so you want to take the point that increases that value by the most. So this, um, this involves a lot of, um, this can involve a lot of compute. And so we, take, we use a lot of tricks in order to speed this process up. One of these tricks is that if what you are doing is essentially adding a new centroid, a point is either going to be closest to this new centroid or closest to one of the old ones. So all you need to do instead of recalculating that max is just say, am I closer to this new potential centroid than I was the old closest potential centroid? So you can just do this max operation, you can save a whole bunch of time, and you can do updates that way. We also use Numa. It seems like there are many packages out there now that use Numa in order to speed up the numerics. Um, it's super fast. Uh, you can just write Python code, and this is the Python code to implement the procedure, and it speeds things up a lot. We can also use uh, algorithm, algorithmic tricks. There's this thing called the, you know, it's politely called the accelerated greedy algorithm, but academics I think call it the lazy greedy algorithm. I haven't quite figured out why, but it basically uses a priority queue whose details I'm not gonna go into here. And you can see that to get the exact same result as before you can, uh, you can, you can get the exact same result but significantly faster. Uh, so we do that and it can actually uh, make, it, it make time line, uh, linear with the size of the data set instead of quadratic. So, that's cool. Okay, so, I wanted to show what this procedure would actually look like. The first example, since it's a greedy approach, is probably going to be representative of the full data set. So it's going to be in the middle. Then the next one is going to be in the most underrepresented region given this. 
which is going to be towards the top, because there's a big cluster to underrepresent it. And if you think about what, where the third one is going to be, it's probably going to be in this bottom cluster. And if you continue this process, this is what it looks like after you've selected 100 samples. It seems to converge towards being kind of uniform. It does represent the regions that are, uh, that are kind of outliers. You see there's an island towards the right-hand side there where there is a point that's selected, but it also respects densities. You can see like the bottom left island or the, the bottom islands in general have more points selected from them because there are more points there overall. So, there's a second class of submodular functions that are called feature-based uh, feature functions. And facility location functions are great and their general purpose, but the problem is that they require quadratic memory to store because you have to calculate similarities between all pairs. If you have a gigantic data set of millions and millions, you're not going to have the memory to do that. Feature-based functions operate on the feature values directly, so you don't need to calculate these similarities. Um, I'm going to skip the math here and just show you the intuition behind how they work. The idea here is that let's say that you have some data set where you have your features as the columns and your examples as the rows, like a canonical data set. If you've selected these five points, the way that you evaluate it is that you sum up the, you sum up the feature values for each feature separately. And so let's say this is the sum for each one of those features. You can see that one of the features has very high values, whereas the other ones might have lower ones. You might be getting the intuition that what's happening here is that we want to select examples that have high values in a diverse set of features. And that's exactly what happens. That what we do next is we apply some, um, we apply some uh, concave function like square root or log, uh, logarithm and what that does is it kind of squashes it down. It says that the marginal gain in a particular feature matters less. That going from a sum of going from 100 to 110 doesn't really matter. You've already seen that feature a lot whereas going from 0 to 10 matters a lot. So that concave feature is important. Then you sum up the values along these concave features. To show you what happens as we select uh, examples, if we select this example, it's mostly redundant with the data set that we've seen already that has high values and features that we've already seen high values in. And so when we apply our concave function, uh, we don't get that much of a gain. There is a gain, and so it went up from 51.2. I just made up this number, but let's say 51.2 to some, you know, 57, and that's, you know, that's nice. But let's say you select this different example that has high feature values in different features that takes these two features that weren't really seen by the set so far, that when you apply your concave function, you still see big gains. And so instead of going from 50, uh, instead of going up to like 57, you're now going up to 63. And so by doing this, you are selecting examples that have high values in different features. You can imagine this would work well when you can imagine that this would work well in the case where the features represent some quality about the data. For example, if you have sentences and you're trying to count the number of words, that each feature is um, some quality about the sentence, the composition of words, um, something about it. But it's not going to work so well when you have things like pixels, because pixel saturation values, you don't really care about optimizing the you know, different sets of pixels that have high values. So we'll see an example of that uh, in a little bit. So you can get uh, great speed ups with the accelerated algorithm as well. That uh, one of the nice things about submodular optimization in Apricot is that Apricot implements a general wrapper for the optimization, including maintaining the priority queue, doing the transformer API, all types of other things. And you can implement your own submodular functions if these aren't happy for you. So uh, you can see great, uh, on these massive data sets, you can see that not only is it fast if you just use the greedy algorithm, but it can be even faster if you use the accelerated greedy algorithm. So, I want to return to Gossip Girl because it's a nice way of adding in, uh, it, it's a nice way of showing you know, things that people can really relate to. Because I'm sure all of you have seen this show, since I've seen it. So, the gist of this show is basically that there's a group of angsty teenagers hanging around Manhattan, basically taking turns hooking up with each other, and in general just disappointing their parents. There's this char character in the background known as Gossip Girl, who sends out these text message blasts just in time to stir up trouble amongst all of the main characters. This is trouble that, of course, uh, could be solved if any of the characters talk to each other like normal human beings, but instead what they choose to do is just glare at each other to let them know that trouble is coming. So this is how the show starts. Spotted, lonely boy, can't believe the love of his life has returned. If only she knew who he was, but everyone knows Serena, and everyone is talking. Wonder what Blair Waldorf thinks. Sir, they're BFFs, but we always thought Blair's boyfriend Nate had a thing for Serena. What an awful thing to say about somebody, much less about, you know, in a text message blast to everybody at your school. 
this is awful. So of course I was immediately hooked. <laughs> and so I talk about this data set a little bit more in the pomegranate talk that I give, but I'm gonna go a slightly different direction here. I'm gonna say that we, uh, we uh, we extracted a data set uh, from this where for each one of the blasts, we encoded, uh, we encoded for each character whether or not it was for or against their agenda at the time in the show. The idea in the Pomegranate Talks, we wanted to figure out who Gossip Girl was, and we figured that Gossip Girl would be the person who, uh, whose agenda was most furthered by Gossip Girl's blast, which kind of makes sense. This is basically what the data set looks like, that you have ones when it's for their agenda, zeros when the person isn't affiliated, and negative ones when it's against their agenda. The problem here is that we want to run feature-based uh, feature selection. because uh, We want to run feature-based selection on this, but feature-based methods can't work on negative values. So what we simply do is we engineer this data set to have two columns for each character, one which says, is this blast positive for them, and one is, is this blast negative for them. You can see that this basically encodes some quality about each one of the blasts, where a higher value means, well, it says one or zero, but a one means something is present here, and a zero means something is not present here. And so when we run our optimization procedure, what we would like to see is that we get a whole bunch of blasts that cover both positive and negative things about all of the characters. Uh, unfortunately, this is Gossip Girl, so the first few uh, blasts only cover negative things about the characters. Uh, this is the first one that was selected that was supposed to be the most representative of the show. And it reads, not so fast, you're not graduating until I give you my diplomas. Mine are labels and labels stick. Nate Archibald, something I'm not going to say here. Uh, Dan Humphrey, the ultimate insider. Chuck Bass, coward. Blair Waldorf, weakling. And as for Serena Vanderwoorden, after today you are officially irrelevant. Congratulations everyone, you deserve it. This is basically how people talked in my high school. I don't know about you, but. <laughs> But you can see like, this, this is the, considered to be a representative blast from the show because it covers a lot of characters. Interestingly, the very next one that's selected is poor Vanessa. Even Cinderella was given the courtesy of a stealth getaway. Um, blah, 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 then something about Jenny Humphrey, who cares about her. Um, what it's basically saying is that these are characters that were not represented in the first blast that was selected. And so it's now focusing on selecting things that were not seen. And so it's gonna proceed through it, selecting things, and eventually it'll probably get to something positive about some of the characters, but certainly not in the top five. Um, so uh, that's an example of what you might get when you run feature-based methods on, um, on this type of data. More commonly, you're probably gonna to wanna to try to use this in order to train machine learning models, which is the boring application of submodular optimization. Uh, but it's in the title of my talk, so I figured I should put a slide in. Uh, basically, what you see here is that uh, on the x-axis is the number of examples we use to train our model, the y-axis is the accuracy, and we use facility location functions, feature-based functions, or 20 iterations of random selection. Uh, you can see that with random selection, uh, we, you can see that basically on the 20 news groups articles where the features correspond to something about the sentences of the paragraphs that both feature-based functions and facility location functions work really well in training good models with only a small fraction of the data. With MNIST, where you're seeing digits, facility location seems to work well because that's operating on similarities. Feature-based values don't work so well because you're not trying to select images that have a very diverse set of pixels that are activated. That in fact, if you optimize for diversity, you're probably gonna see a whole bunch of pixels uh, chosen that are just noise. So that might not be great, and that's why feature-based functions there underperform random selection. So that gets into, uh, my animation went the wrong way here, so now we're covering that one up. So that brings into this important question of how you represent your data. That is an extremely important question when it comes to submodular optimization. Sometimes you can just throw your data in and it works well. Sometimes you have to transform it a little bit. Sometimes our data comes in the form of pixels, like for example, this adorable little corgi. Sometimes our data comes in the form of words, like this, the text that correspondingly goes in the uh, Wikipedia article about it. We have to transform this data into numbers somehow. If what we do, if, if we take that image and all we do is you want a UMAP transformation, uh, this is on the CIFAR 10 data set, then you see we get just a jumble of noise. That there are some things here, like on the bottom right, it looks like cyan and yellow kind of overlap, but that's not really, uh, you wouldn't get a good selection if you tried operating directly on this. 
Fortunately, we have a whole bunch of pre-trained neural networks that we can use in order to get representations. Let's say that instead of operating on our features, on our images directly, we run our images through some pre-trained model that train on, on ImageNet, and we just extract the feature representation that happens at the end, skipping a bunch of things. If we run the same images through this and extract the feature representation, you can see we get a much clearer, um, a much clearer coloring here. I'm going to skip over stuff because I'm running out of time. Um, you can select examples based on the attributions, that there are a bunch of attributes and things which are saying why uh, models work the way that they did. And so you can select ones that were important for a diverse set of reasons. Other things here, the slides will be available soon. I can see Leland trying to kick me off. Um, there's a paper, and if you want to read the paper, it's on archive. There's the GitHub repository. The slides will be there. Um, thank you for your time. So thanks for wrapping up quickly, because it means we do have time for some questions. Uh, do we have any questions for, uh, for Jacob? Over there. I was curious, and this might uh, be a, uh, a spoiler, so you don't have to answer, but um, what did your, uh, you said that you trained the thing on Gossip Girl to predict who Gossip Girl was? Yeah. Uh, who did your thing think it was? So no spoilers about who it might actually be. Well, okay, so the, I, was, I was trying to demonstrate probabilistic modeling and why you might do that, because pomegranate is a package for probabilistic modeling, and it said that you got, got basically the most density around the character Dan Humphrey. <laughs> Um, this is more just a clarification question, but if I have a lot of data and I want to subsample by sort of creating what I think of as a set cover, where I'm just selecting a point and then eliminating all points that are close to it until I basically have just a certain number of points that are uh, given distance apart from each other, kind of, is that similar to what you're doing or is that somehow qualitatively different. I'm not sure exactly how the, the set cover function, how that would work. Uh, it sounds very similar to the facility location function where basically what you do is you choose the point that is central to a whole bunch of other points and then you greedily choose other points that are in you know, clusters of data. Uh, it may not work the exact same way. It sounds like it works similarly. Any other questions? Well, thank you again for your time then. <laughs>